Hi, everybody. Why write? Why do the thing that Hemingway famously said is easy? All you have to do is sit at your typewriter and bleed. <laughs> Yet from a very young age, that is what I wanted to do. When I was four years old, for reasons no one in my family could understand, I picked up my older brother's reading book and I read it. I still remember the first page. It said, look, look. I bet you read that book too. Look, exclamation point, look, exclamation point. And when I realized I was reading it, it felt like every cell in my body settled into place. Of course, I was too young to articulate that I wanted to be a writer. Instead, I thought, I want to live inside books. Unfortunately for me, my Italian-American immigrant family did not have a lot of books in the house. We had a Reader's Digest dictionary, and we had encyclopedias. And I want to tell you, I read all of them, including the dictionary. My town didn't have a library. We didn't get one until I was in fifth grade. So I really had no access to books. I did, however, have access to stories. The writer Truman Capote said that he didn't have books in his household. Instead, in Alabama, his aunts would sit on the front porch and tell stories into the night. And that's how he learned to tell a story. Well, we didn't have a front porch, but we had a kitchen table. And all of my aunts and uncles, my parents, my grandmother and great-grandmother, my cousins, and more Italian relatives than I could begin to name, sat around that kitchen table every night and every day during the weekends. And they told stories. They drank black coffee, sometimes with anisette in it. They smoked a lot of cigarettes. And they told stories. In order to earn a place at that table, you had to learn what made a story good. And so from a young age, although we didn't have books, I listened and figured out how to begin a story, how to build tension, to be sure to give good details, to make sure it has a climax, and then get out of the seat for the next person. When I was in second grade, I had a wonderful teacher named Virginia Nolan. I thought she was about a thousand years old. She had that white hair that in those days was blue. You know, they dyed it and had that funny, like, toxic blue color. She was very wrinkled and had spackle on her face. Two circles of liquid rouge on her cheeks. She wore flowered dresses, and she had this wonderful smell. It was a combination of mothballs, chalk dust, and some kind of flowery perfume. I used to wrap my arms around her leg like a puppy. She used to shake me off, you know. I loved her so much. And she kept books in the back of the classroom. They were called Childhoods of Famous Americans. Maybe some of you read them. Depending on your age, they either had blue covers or orange covers. I won't reveal which color mine were. I used to do my work so fast just to get back there to read. Our day always began with Ms. Nolan walking in the classroom, a public school, 40 kids, she would walk in and say, good morning, class. And we would stand and say, good morning, Miss Nolan. And then we would have a moment of silence, say the Pledge of Allegiance, and sing a patriotic song. Of course, the whole time, I was wondering when I could get to the back to get one of those books. Now, my cousin went to the new elementary school. And they had a school library, though oddly, you couldn't take the books out of it, which doesn't sound like a library to me. One day, she came to our house. And she said, you have to read this book. And she handed me a copy of Little Women. I began it that night. Now, I fell into that book like I can't even explain. I knew immediately that I wanted to be one of the March sisters. There were four of them, Amy, Beth, Meg, and Joe. And I, I don't know a female writer who did not want to be Joe March. She was the one who actually became a writer in the book a Joe fan. <laughs> I loved the book so much that I wanted to do everything the March sisters did. For example, they called their mother Marmy. So I started calling my mother Marmy. And she said, why are you so weird? Stop calling me that. Call me mom. 
The other thing I wanted to do was in the winter, uh, when it was cold, the March sisters would ho bring, hold a baked potato when they went outside to keep their hands warm. And so I asked my mother if I could keep my mittens at home and carry a baked potato to school instead. And you can guess what she said. Why are you so weird? Put on your mittens. Well, this is a spoiler alert if you haven't read the book or seen one of the movies. The most beloved March sister, Beth, the one everyone loves, she's so good, she dies in the book. And it became clear to me that that's what was going to happen. I could not believe a character in a book would die, and I couldn't stop reading it. I read it at the breakfast table. I did the unthinkable thing of sneaking it into school. I put it on my lap, and I'm sure all of you out there who are readers have done this very thing, kind of did this with my hair so that no one would know I was reading. That day when Beth was dying, I did not know that Miss Nolan entered the classroom. I was so immersed in the story. I wasn't aware that the class stood up. I didn't hear them sing the patriotic song. In fact, I didn't look up again until they were all sitting back down. And Miss Nolan, my beloved teacher, was looking right at me, and she said, Anne, you didn't do the morning exercises. You're going to have to stay in for morning recess. In a way, this was a gift. I lived in fear of my glasses breaking in the playground and by a ball, a flying ball, so staying in was actually not so horrible, but getting in trouble was terrifying. 10.10 came. You know, we had those big clocks that the arm used to move very noisily down. It clicked into place. Everyone else went out to the playground two by two. Miss Nolan beckoned me forward. I was so terrified that I still remember what I had on, a pink and white polka dot dress. And because I've always been tall, I was sitting in the back of the classroom and I had to walk down that aisle toward her, clutching little women. She said, what were you doing? Why didn't you, why didn't you do the morning exercises? And I held out little women and I said, Beth died and then I dropped to the floor, crying. <laughs> Miss Nolan looked at me, and the first thing she said was, get up. <laughs> but then she looked at the book I had read, and she said, you're reading Little Women? And I said, yes. And she said, tell me what it's about. So I gave her a synopsis, and she nodded, and she said, you know what? I don't want you to go out to recess anymore. I want you to read all those books I have back there. So I did. Then she got all the books from the third grade classroom, and I read those. And by the time I left her class, I had read all the fourth grade books, too. What a gift. A teacher who saw a little girl who was hungry, and she fed me. I learned that year that I could read to escape. I could read to make the world go away. Now, I don't want to mislead you. I didn't have anything terrible to escape from. However, I was embarrassed by my Italian-American immigrant family. I wanted to live in Samantha's house from Bewitched. And instead, I lived in the house that my great-grandparents bought when they immigrated from Italy in the late 1800s. The house I know now was beautiful, with its leaded glass and hardwood floors. But as a little girl growing up in the early 1960s, this wasn't the kind of house they lived in on TV. They didn't live in houses on TV packed with relatives that you had to kiss goodbye, even though they smelled weird. <laughs> they didn't have grandparents who raised chickens and rabbits in the backyard and every morning slaughtered them so that when I had to kiss them goodbye before school, they had on blood-splattered aprons. My great-grandmother, who was afraid of nothing, she'd been a shepherdess in her village in Italy. There were two things she was afraid of, actually flush toilets. She thought they sucked you down. <laughs> Luckily, she let us have one, but she kept an outhouse, a great source of embarrassment. When people asked me, when kids asked me, where do you live, I'd say, oh, the house with the outhouse, you know, in the middle of town. Once I told a middle school group this, and when they wrote me thank you letters, they said, your life on the prairie sounds so interesting. <laughs> so I'm sure to mention now that I lived right in the middle of town. The other thing she was afraid of was furnaces. She thought that they sent out toxic fumes at night while you slept. So we had a coal stove. In fact, we had it until 1967. Maybe the last coal man in Rhode Island used to come to our house. So these things embarrassed me terribly. 
In third grade, the most popular girl in school, Michelle Kincaid, finally invited me over for a play date. Let me tell you how popular Michelle was. She told us that the Beatles had written the song Michelle for her, <laughs> and we believed her. We walked to her house after school. It was in the new development, and it was a split ranch. And I remember standing in front of that house thinking, architecture has peaked. Why would anybody want any other kind of house? You walked in downstairs, it was dazzling. And then we walked up and I just saw this sea of wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. You know, it was mauve and then powder blue and then sort of like a coffee brown. I, I was gobsmacked, I just stood there. She was already regretting that she'd invited me. She had a dishwasher. I said, what's that? She said, a dishwasher. I said, what's it doing? She said, washing our dishes. Remember, we didn't have a furnace, so this was awesome. Then her grandmother came holding a tray of snickerdoodles. She looked like she was at a central casting with her gray bun and her apron with cinnamon, no blood. <laughs> I got so jealous, I got a stomach ache and ran all the way home into the kitchen where my grandmother, Mama Rose, was stirring something in a pot like one of the witches from Macbeth. <laughs> I cried, I hate my life, and I ran upstairs and I wrote my first short story. It's about a little girl who comes home from school and her grandmother has disappeared. And the little girl's life gets so much better. <laughs> For example, she gets a dishwasher <laughs> and an endless supply of snickerdoodles. Now, because I'm Italian, I, I didn't harm her, she just vanished. And I went downstairs that night to dinner and it was like the world had shifted. By writing that story, everything looked different to me. It looked new. And I began to write disappearing grandmother stories for the next four years. I, I just changed the setting, you know, Revolutionary War grandmother, Victorian England grandmother, Civil War grandmother, gone. <laughs> then I got to junior high and I changed my theme to stories investigating the mysteries of girls and friendship. And then in high school, I, I discovered boys and I began to write about the mysteries of love and courtship. So I learned at a young age that I could read if I wanted to un escape the world, and I could write if I wanted to understand the world in which I lived. And this dual source of comfort really got me through everything, small problems and large ones. When I graduated from high, sco from high school, I went to the University of Rhode Island and majored in English. Um, English majors, I don't know if you're aware of this, they don't have a lot of job opportunities. <laughs> but I thought I needed to read a lot in order to be a writer, and I was correct. But I also thought I needed to see the world. I thought I had to run with the bulls and jump naked in fountains in Paris. Of course, I learned later that Eudora Welty was right when she said all a writer needs to do is sit on her own front porch. But wanting those adventures, I decided I would become a flight attendant when I graduated from college. Now, back in seventh grade, I had read a book called how to, how to Become an Airline Stewardess. And the first line in that book was, would you like a boyfriend in every city in the world? <laughs> I was like, yeah. <laughs> so I still wanted a lot of boyfriends, but mostly I wanted the adventures I thought a writer needed to have. So I went to work as a flight attendant. And while I was flying, I began my first novel, which luckily none of you will ever read. It landed in a dumpster on Sullivan Street in Greenwich Village for very good reason. The book was basically a revenge story against these neighbors of mine who had done me wrong somehow. And I made every first writer mistake. The real woman's name was Terry. I called her Sherry. You know, everything was terrible. And I wrote that book, handwritten, 400 pages. And then one day on a layover in Los Angeles, I got one of those phone calls we never want to have, telling me that my only sibling, my brother, had died in a household accident. I went home that hot, sad summer and spent it with my parents until my mother, my wonderful mother, said to me, you have to go and live your life. You can't sit here with, here with us. And so I moved to that Sullivan Street apartment in Greenwich Village. I sat on the bed and thought, what do I do now with the rest of my life? And I thought, of course, I'll write. And I took out that terrible book, The Betrayal of Sam Pepper, and read about 20 pages before I realized it belonged in that dumpster. And I went outside and threw it in. I took out my typewriter, I had acquired one that summer, 
and I wrote the first sentence of what would become my first novel, Somewhere Off the Coast of Maine. What I understood in that moment was that one of the reasons we write is to make sense of the world we live in. I needed to understand what happens to a family when they lose one of its key members. That book got published, and I went on to write short stories and essays, to have columns in magazines. I retired my wings. In 2002, I found myself living back in Providence, married with two children, my son Sam, who was eight, and my daughter Grace was five. I went off to the Virginia Festival of the Book one April weekend to celebrate my latest novel, and when I came back, I pulled into the driveway and saw my beautiful family there. My husband was cooking out on the grill, my son Sam was setting the table, and my daughter Grace, happy that I was home, ran into the garden and picked me a bouquet of chives. You know how they get those purple flowers? 36 hours later, Grace died from a virulent form of strep throat. We went home from the hospital without her and all got into bed together. The next morning, I remember thinking how audacious it was of the sun to rise. I couldn't believe our neighbors would go to work, that the world would continue when my world had suddenly stopped. I picked up the newspaper that day, more out of habit than curiosity, and for the first time since I saw those beautiful words, look, look, I could not read. Grief and shock stopped the part of my brain that used language, a condition that continued for two years. A wonderful friend suggested I learn to knit, a thing I never thought I would do, but I knit my way through grief. And one day, two years after Grace died, I found myself writing again for the first time, writing the book that became The Knitting Circle, about how knitting saved someone. Why write? The writer John Green, when he was asked that question, said, we write to find the fire in the darkness. I think that's a beautiful image. Why write? I write for all the weird little girls out there. I write for all the confused teenagers. I write for all the broken-hearted adults. I write to show them there is a fire in the darkness. I write to show them that there is hope, that it's right there. Look, look, thank you.